So bear with me. Thank you. Yeah, I'm really excited to be here. I come from the symphony side of things. Hey, this is perfect transition into my first slide here. There we go. So I come from the symphony side of things. Um, though we're not going to talk about symphony today. Um, we are going to talk about B Hat and BDD, which I am also something that I'm a part of. So that's why this is my first DrupalCon, and I'm really excited to see everybody here. I'm really excited to be here. In fact, there we go. Now I can actually see everybody way back there. So uh, I'm in the symphony world. I do symphonies documentation primarily. Um, I also, this is my one slide to sort of hint myself. That that's the company I work for, KMP Labs US. We do mostly um, consulting and training around the symphony sphere. So like I said, I'm all set, everything symphony. This has been sort of crazy so far this week to um, be a part of what basically is about eight times the size of our normal conferences. So it's been awesome. Um, I'm also a writer for KMPUniversity.com, which is uh, basically screencasts and other ways to learn things online. Uh, with good practices and actually not boring. And I'll mention that again later because I'm going to give you guys all a coupon code for uh, a free uh, screencast that's going to cover what we're going to cover today in more detail. So if you like what you see today with BHAT and BDD, which I think you will, you can keep running uh, with it for free after this. So I'll come back to that later. Ah, most importantly, I'm the husband of the much more talented at Leanna Pelham. Uh, and she's fairly well known in the symphony world because I put her in each of my presentations like this. Um, how many people know Leanna? That's, yeah, the, the, the two people in the room I know, basically. Um, so, <laughs> so yeah, and when I did that in the symphony thing, it was like three quarters of the room raised their hand. So uh, if you could all, um, so my favorite things to do before the cat got out of the bag in the symphony community about her, if you could all, if you have your phones, just tweet at her right now. So that's her name. Just say hi. She's here. You can say uh, um, you can, I don't know. Just you can you can heckle me towards her, and she can provide me with that heckling feedback afterwards. So that's probably less distracting than heckling me during it. So say hi to her, and she's here also, and she's awesome, and she's the voice behind Camp University. Come on, I do not want to have to advance myself. That's what I'll do. There we go. Okay. All right, so today we're talking about uh, BHAT, Behavior Driven Development. So let's back up real quick, a little bit of background. Um, where things break down in projects, and I think we will all at least more or less agree with this, is the organization of the projects, not necessarily the development. It's the whole mess of who's doing what and how are we even organizing and planning the features that we're building. So the typical project, and uh, probably this is somewhat familiar to people. How many people, how many people have seen this series? Yeah, okay, good. But I'll probably like half people. Um, yeah, so there's like a million of these things. Uh, this is basically what I'm talking about. So how the customer explained it, how the project leader understood it, how the programmer wrote it, which I actually really like because that just makes no sense at all. I'm a programmer, by the way. So if I'm ripping on programmers, I'm ripping on myself. I'm not an, an outsider. Um, what the customer really needed. And my personal favorite, which is what we gave to the beta testers. <laughs> It's funny because it hits close to home, right? OK, so yeah, so it's sort of funny because this is all like computer science, right? And, and this is sort of what actually happens in the real world. And it's funny because it hits too close to home. So where it breaks down, first and foremost, is uh, different roles, different languages, people of different uh, technical levels. And we are all very important in the overall process. So we have to work together. But we use different languages. And part of the reason we use different languages is obviously because we're at different technical levels. Uh, this one is especially I like for um, programmers is that our code may not align with our business value. The only reason we really write code, I mean, this is not necessarily totally true because as programmers, um, we like to write code. But the only reason we're supposed to write code is for business value, one way or another. Even if that's your pet project, there's sort of business value in that pet project. So does your code actually align with what your business needs? Or does your code, did you kind of go off in a, a direction for four straight days because something was really cool or interesting and really wasn't that important? So being able to uh, align what we're actually coding with the business values um, so that it's basically we're bringing as much value to the company with as little effort as possible. Um, and this is basically what I'm talking about. Uh, so as, if you like to program, then this is probably at some way in the back of your mind, you're like, oh, that's really cool. I should run with that and keep programming it. And I know I'm supposed to be doing this other thing. Uh, and the first thing is sort of over planning, under planning, planning, that whole process. How much do we plan? Are we planning at all? Are we over planning? Are we having um, meetings like two-hour meetings every day? 
six hours of meetings every day? Anybody? Um, are we not planning at all? So kind of getting the planning process so that it, it, we have to plan, right? But actually getting it so that we have um, almost a plan for our plan. How do we plan efficiently? Okay, so let's get down to the, uh, the BDD stuff, behavior driven development. So here's sort of the evolution of test driven development here. Uh, way back when somebody said, hey, we should start testing our code. There's unit test back there. It said, okay, we have a function. When I call this function, I need to assert that basically when I put three and five in it, it comes back as eight because that function is called add. Okay? And then later said, somebody said, we should write our test first. So if we're going to write to the, and by the way, I use the calculator thing because that's sort of the, the, the age old uh, unit testing example. So hey, we should write our tests first and then implement our code. And the advantage there being that um, this is something that's really good for behavior driven development as well is that as programmers, we need to know when to stop. We need to know when the requirements have actually been fulfilled. So with uh, test-driven development, I write the test first, and I stop working and go home as soon as all my tests are green. And I don't need to program any further than that because all, all my tests are passing, so I've basically done my job. And then finally, uh, behavior-driven development is last. That's what we're going to talk about, and it's very, very interesting, by far the most interesting thing on here, at least from my perspective. So the, the, uh, the, the grandpa of this, so of course in technology, if you're a grandpa of something, it happened only 10 years ago. Uh, the grandpa of this is, is Dan North, and he said, this is a good quote, he said, behavior is a more useful word than test. And the idea is we're, we need tests for application, but instead of having them be something that's buried in the developer sphere somewhere, and it's uh, very technical, we want to elevate those so the tests themselves are more about the behavior. What does the user do? Did they go to this page? Did they click this link? When they click this link, what did they see? That's the kind of language that developers understand, because that's what they're building, all the way up to the least technical people, they understand that that's what they're doing as well. Uh, I'll mention this really quickly. Uh, I'm not going to go over this, but if you are curious about this, there's two types of BDD. There's story BDD and there's spec BDD. Roughly what that's talking about is unit tests versus functional tests. If that's not making any sense to you, don't worry about it. If you're like, ooh, I, didn't, I know what that means and that's really interesting, then go ahead and check out. If you're interested in the spec, we're going to talk about the story BDD. So if you're interested about the spec BDD, um, then you can check out this library, which we're not going to talk about. Uh, it's a little bit low level, it's a little bit more of a developer tool uh, only, but it's uh, also very nice. So we're going to talk about what's called scenario-oriented BDD. And uh, by the way, we're going to do, um, well, actually let me ask, how many uh, people would, uh, in the room would consider themselves developers? Okay, that's good. That's kind of what I expected. That was most of the room. And for those of you that didn't raise your hands, it's okay. We're also going to be going through stuff that's kind of useful across the whole thing. Because the whole idea of what we're doing is supposed to be kind of something that can be done on an organization-wide basis. So we're actually going to be going into real code. But developers, hang on with me for just like two minutes because we have to get a little bit of philosophy and then we'll actually go into the actual practices here. So um, with behavior-driven development, the, the goal is to create that single vocabulary so that when we're describing a feature, we're all kind of using the same language to do it. Um, and this comes from all the way from somebody having like this big idea that they don't know about, um, all the way down into uh, implementing it and testing it. Uh, at every stage, we're trying to get back down to like what's the actual feature supposed to do in this specific language. So this is the four-part process that we're going to follow, and this is the theoretical part. This, we're going to go through these uh, uh, one by one in a second. But basically, here's the situation. Somebody comes with you, it's just this big idea. It's like the owner of the company, and you like, bust into your office, or maybe your home on the weekend, hopefully not. Bust into your office and has this big idea, and now we need to get that big idea kind of down into something that's sane. So the first thing we're going to do is, it, it's, is probably he's coming in with what we consider maybe five different features, because he's like, oh, admin area this, and front end this, and mobile that. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to define the business value. The first thing we're going to do is focus on the business value of whatever the idea is. If it doesn't have business value, then it's not actually something we should work on. Second thing is we're going to prioritize those. So now that we've sort of defined five different features and their business value, we'll prioritize those. This one's the most important. This one's the least important. Um, step three, and this is where things get interesting, um, we're going to describe those with readable scenarios. And we'll see scenarios later, but they're actually when we start talking about um, what the actual user story is, meaning they go to this page, they click on this, they do this. That would be a scenario uh, describing your feature. And then finally, and of course this is the behavior driven development part, um, once we've done all of that, we're actually going to implement it. So the idea is we can describe in this language exactly how a feature is supposed to work. And that's actually the starting point for the development process. Regardless of whether the developers are the ones that wrote that or if our project managers are the ones that wrote that, we actually have this specification and the important thing here is the specification is from the user's perspective because no one on the business side cares whether or not we had to create a new database table for this. 
What they care about is the user's behavior. You're able to go to this page, click on this, and see this result. So that needs to be the starting point for us as developers to actually make sure that we're um, accomplishing the end behavior, the end goal that they want. So this is where something called Gherkin comes in. How many people have heard of Gherkin? Okay, okay it was like 25% uh, or so. Uh, fortunately, it's very easy. Gherkin is a language, and it's the language that uh, is uh, used to describe features. So again, we have all these ideas. Somehow, we have to sit down, um, ideally, it doesn't have to be this way, but what if we are all describing these features with a structured language? Because obviously, like anything else, we're developers, so we know that if we're all speaking the same language, then we're going to communicate more efficiently. So a project consists of many features that need to be plan, planned, written, and shared somehow already. It might just be right now an email or a something that's jotted on a piece of paper and then uh, handed to you. So Gherkin is the structured language to do that. And it looks like this. So again, the idea is that we have five features coming in and we've decided to uh, uh, put, uh, separate those five features and we're going to do this. So this would actually go into a file and we would describe the feature using this format. Now, there's three sort of, or I guess there's sort of four variables there. The first one's just feature, and that's just a title. So we do something like feature and just kind of some title that you would know that this is a feature for the admin area. Um, then the three other parts are very, very important. The first part, in order to, this defines the business value. And, it's for, and for developers, this is the hardest one to get right because we're not used to necessarily thinking about the business value. And I'll go over some good ones and some bad ones later, but we typically think of um, something like in order to... Um, Let's see here. Like in order to access the admin area, that's your business value. I was like, accessing the admin area is not business value. You're not making any money because your admin is able to go into the, ad the admin area. You're making money because something more like in order to be managed the products that are on the front of our site, that's kind of the business value. So A is the business value. And I'll give examples of these uh, specifics. B is the role or person who will benefit. So if we go on with the one I said earlier, it would be some sort of admin user or owner of the company, some sort of or content editor. And then C here is a short feature description. Okay, so we're gonna come back to this, but A and B are the two big ones, the business value and who's gonna benefit from that business value. So here's a kind of first example. So uh, it's, you know, they come to you and says, hey, we need to have our site in French. Okay, so this is what your feature might look like for that. The business value is to be able to read the news in French. That makes sense, and you could actually decide that's not really a good business value because we actually don't have any French users. So it kind of spells out whether or not that's actually going to be important to you. As a French user, that would obviously be the person that's going to benefit from this business value. So those first two lines there, I know this is all kind of theoretical stuff still at this point. They force anyone on the chain, and, and this is mostly developers in the room, to think about the feature like, why am I building this in the first place and who's going to benefit? And that, just that small process, uh, like believe me, like I do this. This is how I, I do my sites. This helps you focus. Um, on what is actually going on and like why they would actually want something and potentially ask really uh, constructive questions back like why are we doing this again? Okay, so that step one would you'd get all, you'd basically um, do that for all the different features that are coming in uh, Step two is that you'd prioritize those so let's say we have three different features Those are the three features right there I've obviously not showing the other lines and you just prioritize those this is not something by the way this process that you necessarily need to do this is just a, a kind of a framework it says if you use this process um, you can see how easy it is all of a sudden when you approach a large feature now that you've broken it down into smaller pieces uh, prioritize like well where do we start well that depends on uh, basically how important each of those business values are if it's important for you guys to be able to start adding things into the admin interface immediately then you're going to want to start with the features that benefit the admin user because the front end stuff would, ha would happen later. Okay, now this is where things start to get a little bit more interesting. So we have our feature and we're almost ready to start developing on it and this is where we start describing it as uh, scenarios. And the scenarios are always written in the first person point of view of the person benefiting from it. So that line up there as a site administrator in this case. All the eyes down there, when I do this, we are the site administrator and we're talking at the technical level of the site administrator. Because the goal here is twofold. One, for us to kind of understand and, and be able to uh, get a spec of what we need to build. And two, to do it in a language that can actually be understood by the person we're developing it for. Right? And, and if we can't describe uh, the user's behavior in their language, then this might not be a well thought out feature. If it's so technical that we can't even describe it in, in language that they would describe, then something is poison, something is amiss with the situation. So, I think, 
let's actually go down the next one and break this down. Uh, scenarios break down, and scenarios, the feature thing a second ago, that's important, and it's important to focus on business value. These scenarios, this is where things are very important. Um, so they always kind of break down into the same three pieces, which is given, when, and then. And as I go through this, even if you haven't seen Gherkin before, you're going to be familiar with this because these are basically user stories. They're just structured in a very specific way. So given is always your way to kind of play God and set up things. So if you need to make sure that there are three page nodes in, uh, on your site or something before you uh, start writing your scenario, that's your uh, uh, spot to basically play God and set up the system, the initial state of the system, uh, before the user would start interacting with it. So this guy's given I am on slash admin slash news page. Um, the second part, when, is the action they're going to take. So it's always going to be some setup, and then your user's going to take action. And then finally, then, is going to be what did they observe after they took that action. And this makes sense, right? I'm always, we always want a user to do something and then observe that something happened. Uh, and of course, the, you can also say and and but, and that's just a way to chain it. So the fact that we have and I fill in and and I press, those are just basically whens, those are user actions. So always given, when, and then, and that's a single user path. Uh, this is just one more example, because by the way, when, as you get into this stuff, um, this is kind of the hardest part is to kind of get a feel for uh, how this natural language should be. Um, so given there are five news articles, that's where I'm saying you're kind of playing God and say, okay, we're going to start this uh, user store. I'm going to make sure there's five articles in the database to start, because when I am on slash admin page and I click news administration, then I should see five news articles. That's your way to kind of say, um, hey, when you know, this, is, this is basically the behavior that we expect from the news admin, or sorry, the article admin section. So we're about to kind of switch gears into what we can do with the Gherkin stuff. If nothing else, uh, if we didn't do anything else, I'd want you to walk away and say, that was interesting. Um, we should kind of like look at that Gherkin language and at the very least kind of uh, maybe start to structure our conversations in that way, at least of thinking about things in terms of scenarios and user stories, because that made sense in breaking things down into features. It would give us that kind of consistent language just to help make things a little bit more sane. But it's going to get much better than this because we're going to turn those into tests. And this is where things get really nutty. So the behavior-driven development and Gherkin is what we've talked about so far. We're going to switch gears now to a library called Behat. So having a standard way of describing our features and our scenarios is cool. Having that human readable language execute as functional tests against our application is way, way more interesting. So Behat. So I'm going to introduce a few different libraries to you guys piece by piece. Okay. The first one is Behat. This is just a PHP library. And what it allows you to do, and you'll see why this is useful in a second, is it allows, it basically allows you to write those scenarios, the given, the when, and the then. What it does is it parses those given whens and thens, and for each of those lines, executes a PHP function. And the idea is that if we, if we say something like, given there are five articles in the database, that would map to a PHP function, where in that function we actually guarantee that there are five articles in the database. So we'll write human readable sentences, it's going to be executing a PHP function for each of those sentences. Uh, how many people have heard of Composer? That's more than I was expecting. That is great. So that's great. I'm not going to talk about Composer. Composer, uh, I mean, I'm not talking about it, obviously. I'm not going to talk about Composer. Composer is a... OK, so I'm going to talk about Composer very little bit. Uh, it's a glorified downloader. It's actually much more than that. It's a sort of fundamental change in Symfony, or sorry, in Symfony, in PHP. Wow. Um, fundamental change in PHP that's going to allow all the different uh, communities to share code and share libraries much more easily. Uh, but for our purposes, it's a glorified downloader, and it's going to help us download the Behat library into our project. So by the way, I'll post these slides online. And also, as I go through these slides, uh, I will have um, little bitlies in different spots. Uh, so if you're like, ooh, what was that code that he used to install Behat? I have bitlies on here, so you can uh, just jot those down. So this is uh, what using Composer looks like. Composer is just a uh, FAR file, which is an executable PHP file. So you grab it, and then you make a composer.json file, which looks like this. And this is basically a fancy little file that says, please go download the Behat library into my project. OK, so this is uh, all, all about Composer at this point. Um, so I'm not going to park on that too much. And this is the actual way that you tell Composer, go read that composer.json file, which is just a configuration file, and download Behat, which is what we had under that require key, into our project. 
Okay. Now, if you don't, aren't familiar with Composer, the end result of this step is we ha now have the BHAT library downloaded into a vendor directory in our project, and that's it. So nothing really scary has happened. It's just downloaded it for us, but this is the way that you're actually going to install it. Um, one other thing that it did, so I sort of lied a little bit. So it downloaded BHAT into the vendor directory, and it also gave you a bin slash BHAT executable. And quite literally, like if you, you could do all of this inside of your Drupal project, it will put BHAT in the vendor directory and give you this bin slash BHAT file. You can run it. This is just an executable, and this is what running BHAT looks like. Uh, this is obviously its sort of help page, and we're going to use BHAT several times. So, so far we have BHAT in a vendor directory, and we have a single executable file, and that's it. Nothing uh, uh, it's scary or impressive yet. So what BHAT needs to work is feature files. And so earlier when we were creating our feature, I said for each feature you put that in a file. That quite literally means that we will create a file called something like uh, article admin dot feature and we will put the feature and the scenarios under that feature inside of that file. So what bhat needs is just these feature files, a single PHP class which is going to be empty by default, I'll show you that in a second, and that's it. And later we're going to add a configuration file but we're not going to do, worry about that yet. So basically, the only thing you need to start with bhat once you've installed it is a single PHP class. You run bin slash bhat dash dash init, and that gives you that single class. So you can see it created a features directory, a features slash bootstrap directory, and then a features bootstrap feature context.php class. So, so far I have bhat downloaded into my vendor directory. I have that bin slash bhat executable, which I've just used to create this one file. And we'll talk about why that's important, that file's important in a second. Um, but I want to keep, keep the score, if you will, about just the few things that are happening. There aren't big, global, weird changes happening. And this is what that class looks like by default. So I'll talk more about the significance of this in a second, but it is literally an empty class. So it did generate this file. Don't worry about this yet. Cool. So let's, um, we're obviously going to work our way up to doing some really interesting, interesting things with our testing our websites. Let's first test uh, the using the LS program. So let's kind of rewind 20 years or 30 years or 40 years, probably 40 years, um, to when uh, basically pretend like we're developing the LS uh, uh, utility for Unix. So Linus Torvald like, calls you on his phone and you guys are talking and he's like, hey, I need you to build the LS utility for me. And you're like, you know what, I'm going to use BHAT to test that and do uh, behavior driven development. So we're going to describe the ls as a feature. So what I've done here is see, remember it created that features directory. So I'm actually going to put an ls.feature file in the features directory. And I'm not going to, I'm going to talk less about the uh, feature stuff up on top, but you can see that's the business value and the person that's going to benefit from it. And then this is your first requirement. Linus says, um, okay, hey, if you have two files in a directory, then when you run ls, you should be able to see them. That's the behavior of the application. So you're like, okay, that's a scenario. That's sort of like one user flow. So let's turn that into a scenario. And remember, we're, we're writing in the natural, uh, the voice of a Unix user, because that's who is going to get a benefit from our business value. So it makes sense for us to run commands and do other things that a, a Unix user is comfortable doing. So the scenario is to list two files in a directory. So given I have a file named foo, and I have a file named bar, when I run ls, then I should see foo in the output, and I should see bar in the output. Okay. And by the way, th I'm just making this language up. I'm following given when then, but other than that, I'm just saying whatever sounds most natural to me, putting myself in the shoes of a, uh, a Unix user. So there's not any rule or is why, why did I use this word here or something like that. This is just me making these things up. So now we've run that, uh, we've written our first feature file with a single scenario in there. We're going to execute bhat from the command line. And this is what it looks like. You can see it's actually finding our feature file and you can see it going over our scenario there. And what it's saying is it says uh, five undefined steps there in the bottom. Because remember what bhat does is it reads each of those lines. By the way, each, each of these lines is called a step. So I'll say step sometimes and I'll also say kind of scenario line sometimes. So five undefi undefined steps because it tries to find a function for every step. So I'm going to read this step, this one line. I'm going to try to find a function to execute for that. And the way it does that is via regular expressions. So below that output that you just saw, so this is still a command line, it actually prints out a bunch of regular expression functions that you are then going to copy into that feature context class. So you end up with something that looks like this. So you wrote this language, you just invented that language, you ran bhat, and bhat actually dumped out all these uh, functions with regular expressions above them. 
that match the language that you used inside of your scenario. So the one on top is a regular expression that says, given I have a file named, and then there's a little like wild card syntax there. Uh, anytime you quote text inside of uh, a, a scenario, so like given I have a file named quote foo unquote, when it generates the regular expression for you, it puts that in a wa little wildcard syntax there. And then when that line is actually read, next time it reads, given I have a file named foo, it will execute this function. And as for the arg1 value, it will pass you foo or bar or whatever you have there. Um, so step five here is uh, all we need to do now is we wrote the scenario. It generated all the PHP code and regular expression stuff that we needed. So we don't ever have to write regular expressions with this, I remember when I first started hearing about B hat, I was like, I was like, I know what the next step is going to be. It's going to be regular expressions, and I'm going to leave. So no regular expressions. I use B hat all the time. I've never actually even really needed to tweak a regular expression. So it generated the methods for us with the regular expressions uh, above them. All we need to do now is fill in the guts of that. So I, given I have a file named foo, we'll just touch that file to make sure it's there. I have a directory named uh, dir, so we're using the make dir. Um, I run, that's us running a command, so we use the exec function to run it, and then, uh, then I should see in the output, and um, don't worry about this, but basically this is using, um, basically what this last line does here, and I did this kind of mostly for brevity on this uh, slide here, is it basically checks to see if this string here is in that output, and if it's not, it throws an exception, it throws an error. So you could actually just do uh, normal string checking there to see if this string is in that string, and if it's not, throw an exception. So now when we run bin b hat, it actually passes this time. So what b hat does, it reads each of those steps and then executes the function that's tied to it by regular expression. And of course, what we're doing in those functions is creating a file, creating another file, running ls, and then verifying that those things were in the output. So actually behind here, if I like did a, if I did like an ls here, I'd actually physically see a foo in a bar file because that we were just creating a foo in a bar file right inside that directory. Yes, I always forget I have that slide up there. <laughs> How many people know what this is? OK, yeah, I figured it's a celebratory thing. Um, if you want to see the LS thing, because the LS thing is really cool as far as like how BHAT itself works, there's a bit.ly, and I'll post the slides later, and actually goes through um, some, some other complexities and things that you would actually do in this case. So again, BHAT, you rewrite a scenario step. It matches the regular expression inside the feature context class. So it calls that function. And then in that function, we do something. And then unless the function throws an exception, it's a pass. So the way that you fail is you throw an exception inside that function. And then that would actually come up as a failure. Cool. So let's go into the next part here. So having a, um, this LS thing is cool, but let's, uh, uh, the, the end goal, of course, is to do something on the web. So. One more library, and then we're going to put them together, and all kinds of crazy things are going to happen. So bhat executes functions. Mink, totally different library, which is wonderful. Mink is probably my all-time favorite single library inside of PHP, and I would use it in any project where I was doing any type of testing at all. So what it is, it's a standalone library. So just you, can, you guys can bring this library or either of these libraries into your Drupal 5 projects right now if you wanted to. It's just a standalone library. Bring it in there. Uh, and it allows you to command a browser in PHP. So kind of you would have a functions where you're, where you're basically able to say, go to this page, click on this link, fill out this form, press this button, and then look on the screen to see if you saw what you thought you would see. So we're going to go through Mink very quickly because it's a very easy library, fortunately. Uh, this is what it looks like to use Mink directly. You, you create what's called a driver and a session. Those aren't very important until the next slide. And this is actually what you have Mink do. That session, you can think of that as basically like a browser. So you say session arrow visit, you give it a website. And then once you've done that, you can get the uh, status code, you can get the current URL um, from that page. You can also go further to use CSS selectors. So OK, I went to bhat.org. Now that I'm there, I can use CSS selectors to drill down into different parts of my DOM. And once I've done that, I could actually go and get the text, attributes, um, uh, HTML, anything I want about those. And ultimately, like, click on an element or fill out an HTML form or do whatever we want. What's happening in the background when we run this, so this is actually just a, a PHP file. And if I, if I just went to the command line and executed this PHP file, it's actually in the background by default using curl. It's going in the background and actually going to bhat.org and then going through the DOM 
and actually finding the link and clicking the link. And if we had it filling out forms, it would be physically going there and finding the form fields that we want to fill out, filling those out and actually submitting the, uh, the, the form. So this is actually making real HTTP requests in the background. This is not some sort of fake system. Um, this is effectively like a very powerful crawling tool. Um, two other things I will tell you about, well, sort of one other thing I'll tell you about this is very easily, and we'll see this in a second, very easily, without changing anything but one line in the beginning, I can have this test run in Selenium. Just so change one line at the beginning, and all of a sudden, a real browser is popping up. And you're clicking here, and it's actually going there. And this is why this stuff gets so powerful, because you're going to have uh, t things that you want to test that rely on JavaScript, and you can't do that unless you open in Selenium or something like Zombie, um, but basically something other than just curl requests. The other thing is, it means, see how we have this, uh, this LE click thing here? There's lots of other functions that you can use on that, um, especially, or well, uh, it's most interesting if you're using something like Selenium. You can say double click. Right click, um, hover over, hover off, uh, uh, blur, focus, uh, right click, drag to. So you can actually use this interface to say, find this CSS element and drag it to this other one. That's all possible. There basically isn't anything I haven't found that this API can't do. Um, it's all there, even like the weirdest JavaScripty kind of stuff. So if we're able to have this mink object inside of uh, BHAT, inside of our feature context, uh, inside the place where a second ago we were just touching files and doing very low-level things, we could be very dangerous because then we could start saying things like, given I am on slash admin. And then in our function, we could say, okay, mink, go to the slash admin page. Okay, and that's exactly what we're going to do, and we're going to do it with a very, very small amount of effort. So bhat and mink are two different libraries. Mink extension is a plugin. So when you hear extension in the bhat world, that's the name for a bhat plugin. So Mink extension is going to make putting these together uh, just a matter of configuration. Cool, so I'll go pa uh, past this quickly, but basically if, if you were sort of following along with your project, you'd already have bhat installed, so all you need to do at this point is install Mink and this Mink extension library, which is nothing more than, again, this is Composer stuff, but again, all this is doing is just downloading things into the vendor directory of our project, a glorified way of doing that. Um, so you can, that's just a, a, a few more libraries up there that, uh, that we need. So our, all of this does is add a few more things into our vendor directory, and that's it. I'm a big proponent. You could probably tell about less layers and simple things. I don't, like, I don't like going to a talk and being like, that was cool, except I have no idea what was going on. He told me to like, start using Windows again or something, and I got scared. You know, it's very, very small layers here. Um, at this point, we have uh, like five different libraries that are in the vendor directory of our project the feature context class, and a single dot feature file. And that's it. So there's not a lot going on. Um, in this case, uh, we are going to create what's a bhat.yaml file. So, so far, we haven't done any configuration of bhat. And for the most part, you don't. You will make this bhat.yaml file. And what this basically says is, hey, bhat, look at this mink extension thing so that you can tie them together. So I'm not going to park on this detail, but this is what the bhat configuration file looks like. It just sits at the root of your project. Uh, the only interesting thing here is probably the base URL. So if you're testing your application, that would be, uh, if you, let's say we're doing local development, that would be something like you know my site.local. Uh, because when we use bhat and mink together in a second, that's going to tell it kind of what domain to be uh, making the request to. And the only other change you need to do is go to the, the feature context class and change it to extend mink context instead of bhat context. Now, some of you in the room are going to be very comfortable with the namespaces, object-oriented stuff, and other people are not going to be as comfortable. Um, there, when you use bhat, this is obviously object-oriented stuff. Now, for the most part, uh, depending, well, it depends on your level, you may not deal with this stuff very much or you may deal with it a, a lot. It basically depends on where you are in the developer food chain. Are you a developer or are you more, more of a QA person? Um, so, for the most part, though, don't let that scare you. The good news about this stuff, and, and by the way, bhat is not a brand new idea. This is based off of Cucumber. So, you don't have to use bhat. You can use Cucumber. Um, but the reason we have bhat is because we're PHP developers, and that's the syntax that we're familiar with. So even if you're not totally familiar with the object-oriented stuff and that's somewhat new to you, you're still developing in PHP. So there are going to be some weird little things to, uh, to kind of learn to pick up on as far as the object-oriented side of things, but it's PHP. You're calling functions, and it should feel very familiar versus kind of going to a totally different language and having your developers try to, try to uh, do this stuff in, in something like Ruby. Okay. 
So extending, a second ago, by the way, that said extends b hat context, because remember that class was generated for us. Now it says extends mint context. And that did two things for us. The first thing is, anywhere inside of our feature context class, remember that's where we write our, our, our functions, um, we have access to the, the mink object. And that's the one we saw a second ago. So very quickly now you can see, oh man, I have access to the mink object. I can start making it surf around to different pages and find things and click links and right click and double click. And the second thing it gave you, and this is much more interesting, is a pile of definitions. So a step is a single line in a scenario. A definition is the PHP code uh, that's executed when that step is read. And one of the great things about using BHAT is as you use it more and more, your list of definitions is going to get uh, greater and greater and greater. On day one, you may have some basic definitions so that you can say, hey, when I go to this page and click this, those might be built-in sentences that you can say because those come out of the box. I'll actually show you that in a second. But eventually, you'll, you'll start having your own custom definitions. And what that means is your own custom sentences that hook up to some functionality. And after, let's say, a few weeks or a month, your bag of pre-built sentences that you can use to test your application is going to get greater and greater and greater. And what ends up happening is more and more and more, you're able to write sentences to test your application and not actually have to touch PHP code at all. Because you have this big bag of ready-to-go sentences that you can just pull from to say, go to this page, log in as this user with this role, create this node, all these built-in definitions. So a second ago, before we extended mink context, those were the four built-in definitions we had. But that's really the only language that we could have used so far in our scenario file. And obviously, those are the four that we did for the LS feature. And by the way, I got this by running uh, bin slash bhat dash dl. So that stands for definition list, list my definitions. After we extended mint context, this is what we have. And I know you can't read that, which is awesome. Basically, all the normal things you do in a web uh, context are already done for you. When I go to slash foo and I click on search and I fill in this field and then I should see this in this element, all of those things you can say and you don't have to write the PHP code to do it because you've inherited it now from the uh, make extension library. So example of this, suppose we're testing wikipedia.org or this could be your site. Let's create a feature. Okay, so that's what the feature looks like. We're actually going to test the search part of Wikipedia. And there's a scenario. Okay, given I am on slash wiki slash main page, when I fill in search with behavior driven development and I press search button, then I should see agile software development. This runs without any coding because those were all definitions that were built in. If I looked at that definition list, you would have seen things like when I go to and then a little wild card. That tells you, you're like, oh, I can just write in my scenario when I go to slash admin, and I don't have to write the PHP code to command and make to do that. It's already done for me. So day one, you're going to get a whole bunch of these things out of the box, and that's what I'm talking about. Like, as the days go by, you're going to write your own, and it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger, and the menu of things you're able to do is going to get greater and greater and greater. Um, so let's talk about uh, B hat inside Drupal specifically, because B hat inside Drupal is, is uh, actually exceptionally interesting because of the sort of special uh, challenges of, uh, of uh, having a, a Drupal application. So, so far we've talked about what I call black box testing, which is we're here on our local development box or some server, and we're going to test something that's way over there. Totally different server. We just used uh, B hat and make a second ago to test Wikipedia. Clearly, I do not have access to Wikipedia servers. Who cares? We're just making real HTTP requests. So I call that black box testing. And there are some extra challenges with that because you can't, of course, write tests that, uh, you know, if you write a test that says, you know, log in with this username and this password, your tests have the potential to break two weeks later if somebody changes that sort of test user's password. So you have special challenges when you do the black box testing, but it's incredibly pragmatic. You guys could all, during the next session, or at the end of this session, actually install BHAT and start testing your production application right from your local machine by writing these human readable sentences. And probably without doing any PHP code, you could probably do quite a bit of damage with it. So that's called black box testing. And then the other way of testing is actually more for custom development. And this is where we actually take control of the Drupal instance and say, no, 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 no. Before I start this test, I want you to insert these three nodes, these three page nodes, and these two users. And this user should have an administration role. So that in the rest of the scenario, you can say, when I log in as that user and I click to edit this node, basically the rest of your scenario, you're guaranteed to have that set of data because you've actually taken control of Drupal and put those items into the database before the test ran. 
So it's like, how do we do this? Uh, how do we sort of bootstrap Drupal or get access to Drupal inside of, uh, uh, inside of our feature context, our BHAT class? Um, unfortunately, you don't really have to uh, worry about that. I'm actually going to skip past this really quickly. This is, this is exactly what I said before. It's okay if I want to install this stuff on my application. Um, that bitly up there is just that composer.json file. So number two, though, is the question. It's like, okay, how do we get access to Drupal? And the answer is somebody else already did it for you. So introducing, some of you guys already know this, but just if you do not, pretend like you're surprised and it's awesome anyways, because this is really, really awesome. Introducing a library made by the Drupal community, which I did not help with. So I always like to say when I should not be given credit for something, though I have looked at this library and I was like, this is awesome, called Drupal Extension. Yes, this is awesome. Oh, that's nice, yeah. I love you guys. <laughs> So uh, Drupal extensions, okay, so you're already excited about it, which is, which is, I haven't even told you what it does yet. Um, so it gives you a number of things. One, even more built-in step definitions. So even more things uh, 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 that are helpful or Drupal specific um, are sentences that you don't have to write any PHP code for. They're just gonna be there. So if you ran, installed this Drupal extension and ran that bin slash bhat dash dl, the definition list, the list is gonna be twice as long with things that you can run out of the box. Second thing is it gives you the uh, ability to actually hook into your Drupal instance and take control of the data. So with very simple, I'll show an example of this in a second. You can start adding nodes and users and, and, uh, and other things. It also gives you, this is a really cool thing, which is not Drupal specific at all, although we didn't realize that until I saw these guys implement it, the idea of regions. And what this is going to be, instead of saying something like, when I click submit, um, it's like, well, what if I have three buttons on my page that all have the word submit on it? How does uh, uh, Mink know which of those three buttons to do? And in those cases, you have to do a little bit more work to kind of target it. Well, there's sort of a built-in support for regions, so you can basically say, I'm going to call, let's say we have a sidebar region. I'm going to go in a configuration file and say the sidebar region has this CSS selector. You know, sidebar region has pound sign sidebar. Um, uh, that's its CSS selector. Then in your uh, steps, you can say, when I click on search in the sidebar region. So it makes this much easier where you can be confident that you're targeting the little spot you have. Um, and the original reason that uh, um, this was sort of thought up is if we change themes, uh, in theory, it can just be a change of configuration if you're using a lot of regions, because your region might not be pound sign sidebar anymore. It might be something different. But if you're sort of referring to it generically as the sidebar, um, then you can just change the configuration file to point to a different CSS selector. Uh, and this one I'm going to mention again, uh, hooks to load more sentence definitions from uh, contrib modules. I'm going to come back to that one in a second. One. This one has dangerous, dangerous, awesome potential, especially with a community the size of the Drupal community and as active as the Drupal community is. So I'm going to talk about that one again in a second, but I want to show you an example first. So this is a scenario. Um, I am not a Drupal developer, and I did this in about five minutes, and it worked out of the box, and I had nobody to high, nobody to high five because there was nobody there with me, um, but I was really excited. So given I am uh, logged in as a user with the administration role, by the way, this is using something called a background. Don't worry about that. Basically, that's a given statement. Uh, given I'm viewing a page node with the title Cool Beans, when I click Edit in the body region and I fill in the following and I press Save, then I should see Ipsum in the body region. Whoops, my bad. There we go. Yes. Um, and actually, this actually works. I should have been a little bit more descriptive with this. What A better test would have been, um, with the title cool beans, then I should see cool beans in the body region. So just kind of pretend that's there. This actually works, but not, it's not as clear as I would want it to be. So this is what's really cool about this. This is with the Drupal extension installed. When I say given I am logged in as a user with uh, the administration role, or the, sorry, the administrator role, that actually goes behind the scenes, creates a user with a random username and a random password in the database, gives them that role, then tells Mink to surf to the login page, puts in the username and password of that user, hits submit, and is done. All of that happened with that one sentence behind the scenes. Yes, this is what I'm talking about. This is incredible potential. Uh, same thing down here. Given I'm viewing a page node with title Cool Beans, this actually creates a node of type page and gives it that title behind the scenes. Those are built-in definitions that came with the Drupal context, so you don't have to uh, uh, do any coding uh, if you don't want to. Um, but what's really cool about this, of course, is when you do find something that's not built in, you now have a library, this Drupal extension, that's doing things very similar to what you might need to do in Drupal. So it's like the age-old thing where it's like, we have examples. So even when you need to push this further than the Drupal extension might be giving you, you have a nice library that's already doing things, interacting with Drupal behind the scenes, and you can be like, oh, I just need that same thing, but just changed a little bit. 
Um, and then, uh, and then this is, of course is the the region thing that I was talking about. Uh, that's specific to the Drupal extension as well, which I actually really really like. Um, so that's it. So I did a Drupal install uh, nat uh, out of the box. I installed Behat. I wrote that feature in that scenario, and I ran it, and it worked. And that just worked completely out of the box for me. I went to my database, and I saw there was a new username in there, and a new node, and all that kind of stuff. Because um, you know, when things work on the first try, you're usually suspect, like that. Well, I don't know. Um, these are, uh, the Drupal extension runs in three different modes. The, there's the black box mode that I was talking about before. There's also a Drupal and also a Drush mode. What these define is how should we take control of the Drupal instance. The black box mode doesn't take control at all. So if we did, if we were using the black box mode and we wrote given I have a user uh, with the administrator role, that actually throw an error and say in, in black box mode, um, you, you're not allowed to do that. And this is what you would use, uh, you'd use black box mode if you're touching, uh, testing against your production machine or your staging machine, and you're not actually intending to mutate the data, you're, you're there to be, kind of be a witness. What I really like, and, and this library has just been built beautifully, it's just a, a, such a fantastic example of uh, developers from the Drupal community coming in um, and using a tool that was made more by the Symfony-ish community and just doing an absolute wonderful job with the implementation of it. So behind the scenes, you can go into Drupal or Drush mode. So as far as I do want you to take control of my Drupal instance and insert things in the database, how does it do that? The Drupal uh, mode which is perfect for local development. It actually bootstraps that local development instance and it just calls the same kind of uh, functions, uh, you know, create node, uh, add user, those types of things. Um, those probably aren't actually the function names. I have used those functions before, but I'm not fluent. Uh, it uses those to actually create those users. Cool. Drush, that one's very interesting. This is where it actually uses Drush behind the scenes. So this gives you the potential to uh, be executing your tests locally and have Drush pointing to some other server. And it's actually adding users and nodes and things like that. Now that one's a little bit, um, and I'll kind of mention uh, uh, some of the people behind this so you can talk to them after. That one's a little bit of a working process because I don't think that uh, Drush, uh, at least right now, the version I was using necessarily supports um, certain things like creating nodes, um, but I'm talking way outside of my area of expertise. And all of this um, works across the board. Of course, this one maybe not because that one's changing all the time. But basically, there are drivers inside the library that you just set the mode. You're like, I'm using Drupal 6. So when it goes to interact with uh, Drupal, it's like, OK, we're using the Drupal 6 functionality or we're using the Drupal 7 functionality. So this is not a 6, 7, or 8 tool. It's just been written beautifully. So it's basically, it's got a driver layer so that you just tell it what version and it knows how to call, how to interact with your Drupal instance. Um, okay, this is the last thing that I was going to talk about, which is the contributed modules, and this is where the, the potential is uh, huge for this community. So imagine that you bring in a module, some popular module that helps you do thumbnailing or the views module, and that module actually has packaged within it, people have contributed built-in definitions. So you install the Drupal ex uh, extension and you get all of these beautiful Drupal specific things. Then you install views, and of course I know views is core in Drupal 8, but just follow me with this. You install the view module, and all of a sudden you have 20 more built-in definitions that are specific to views, and all of a sudden you have things like given I have a view with this and that and this and that. So every module that you install gives you more and more pre-built definitions that you could use. This is not something that is there yet. What's there is the Drupal extension already has built-in hook points to automatically bring those in. The only thing that the community that we need to do is actually go into those different modules and add them. So in, if you guys are using the views module, for, for instance, and you're testing against that, I guarantee you're going to start writing sentences like this, given I have a view, this and this and this, and behind the scenes, you're actually going to write the code, the, your own custom definition to take care of that. If you contribute that back to the view module, and somebody brings the view module in, this will automatically pick that up, and the rest of the Drupal community, which I understand is quite big, will enjoy that, and hopefully they'll give you your things back. Um, and this is, this is especially interesting because of the, the black box testing. It's all of a sudden you have this uh, site that's on production. You don't even necessarily have developers, or, or uh, uh, and, and it's, you have these uh, 10 modules installed on it, and you can actually test it with this huge uh, uh, glossary index of these built-in definitions from all of the different modules that you have. So this, to me, if that takes off, it's game over. This is going to get totally out of hand in a really exciting way um, really, really quickly. The fact that as a community, we're basically sharing these definitions, these built-in functionalities to accomplish things. 
So do it. This is this is exactly what we want. People are going to people are already using BHAT. It's a matter of us contributing things back and, and kind of getting that conversation with um, module maintainers that may or may not be familiar with uh, BHAT and kind of talking about the the pros of doing this. Last thing I'll talk about, and it's so easy. Um, you want to run these tests in Selenium? Because so far, when you run these tests, when you write these English sentences, it's just running curl requests in the background. It's just silent. It's not actually opening a real browser. That's all you do. That's it. On a scenario by scenario basis, you opt in to Selenium or you don't opt in to Selenium. And that's it. So if we have a feature with five scenarios and only one of them actually requires JavaScript, I mean, the rest of them, it's, it's the same JavaScript on or off, you'd have four scenarios without that little at JavaScript and you'd add the, Java, add, add the at JavaScript where you need it. If we ran uh, bin slash bhat with this, Actually, I'll come back to that slide in a second. It looks exactly the same. If you could actually see this, what happened is it ran, a browser popped up, it did all of those things I commanded it to do with human readable sentences, and then it closed, and it said that it passed. So this is real world stuff. This is why I use Behat and Mink more than anything else, because I end up with a test suite that's like 75% headless, meaning uh, things that don't require JavaScript. And if you don't open up a browser, it runs faster, because opening up a browser is just something that's a little bit more expensive. And then I have 25% of my test suite that does require JavaScript, so psh, I just put that little flag on there and I'm done. It also makes debugging a little bit easier, because I might have something that doesn't require JavaScript. But I'll just add the at JavaScript for a second so I can actually see it pop up and, and, uh, and actually like, see what, what the test is saying. Um, uh, so I can see like, why the heck my test is failing. Oh, and uh, this is how you run Selenium. So <laughs> if you haven't run Selenium, you download a jar file and you run one command. And that's it. So even the Selenium side of things at this point is sort of absurdly easy. Cool. And uh, uh, basically we're done at this point, except. Well, I'm done. Now it's your guys' turn, your homework. One, install the Drupal extension. Uh, it's a project on Drupal. That's just a bit.ly to go to the project on Drupal. It tells you the installation instructions. It's even easier than what I've told you because uh, it takes care of uh, downloading everything else for you. Second, write uh, some features for your app. And there's documentation on uh, how those look. And that's it. High five your teammates and celebrate. You actually can start testing. You can do this this afternoon. You can do this uh, uh, this weekend, tomorrow, uh, during the hackathon. Um, and last thing I'll say is if you want to go further with this, and this is what I was talking about earlier, you can go to our website, kmpuniversity.com. That coupon code is going to be good until tomorrow. So just I see people already doing it right now. Just make an account, and that usually costs $12. We're just giving it away for free. That's going to take, um, that's really going to take you through a lot of the um, basically everything that you're actually going to need to know. We don't talk about the Drupal extension. It's the only thing we don't talk about specifically there. But everything else you're going to need about Drupal is going to come from uh, that screencast right there. Second thing, talk to the open sourcery people. I haven't mentioned their name yet. The open sourcery people, they're a company here in Portland. They're absolutely awesome. They're the ones that have been so far just driving this stuff. So there's no official company and funding behind doing the Drupal extension things. Um, but they've been doing it because they're using it uh, as I understand, basically on everything right now. They're using it on all their client sites. They have been awesome. They're doing wonderful things. Um, so read their blogs and find those guys. Um, and last thing, my friend Melissa Anderson, um, if, if you're more of a business person um, or really anything, she has been doing a tremendous amount of this work and she's thinking about this problem from a holistic thing, like who actually writes these things, um, who runs them when they fail, who's notified, uh, what are the challenges with sort of the live black box testing type of thing. Uh, she's wonderful. She also um, did quite a bit of work on writing BHAT tests for Drupal.org to facilitate the Drupal 6 to 7 upgrade. There you go. Oh, yeah, and she's right there. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, she's right there in the corner. Yeah, her friend was selling her out, which I thought was awesome. Cool, and, and that's it. And the last thing I'll say is special thanks to Jonathan uh, Hedstrom. He works for Open Sorcery, and he was absolutely awesome in helping out with this. And he is the main author, um, with, along with some other people, uh, about the Drupal extension. And uh, oh, and that's Leanna and I, and we love you. I'm so happy to be here, and thank you very much for having us. Um, you can see that I was tweaking things last second. <laughs> you have a question? Yep. Uh, is this on? Yeah, it is worth noting also that it is uh, very easy and possible to integrate a suite of Behat tests with Jenkins, which when you are working with an automated dev flow uh, is really, really awesome because you set up a bunch of tests and you have immediate regression testing. Um, so we are doing that on a number of our sites and uh, it is worth the, the extra one step 
if you're already using Jenkins, to integrate your Behat test with Jenkins. Yeah, it's very easy, and, and uh, if you're interested in doing that, just go tackle him, because obviously he has lots of experience in it. And we do it the same thing. It's not, it's not hard at all. Um, so absolutely. Yep. Uh, do we have any metrics yet on speed comparisons between B this tool and, say, like Cucumber Capybara? Uh, it, it's, as far as that's going to be the same, because the, where you slow down, it's, uh, you slow down because it's hitting your site. So it comes down to how fast is your site loading. Uh, as far as like which one loads faster, it's, it's not going to be enough. Your site's what's slowing you down. So if you're using Selenium, mm -hmm. I'm, my assumption is that basically, especially if you're developing on localhost, you're going to have a browser window pop up and then disappear. Mm -hmm. That's much. absolutely correct, yeah. Because like you can barely, I doubt you'll be able to actually see what's going on. Oh, so, so good. There, so good, yeah, yeah, sorry. So is there a way to like slow it down and like make it do a delay between each step? Yeah, so I'm so glad that I paid you to ask that question. Just kidding. No, that was, uh, it, I love it. You're already thinking ahead to like the debugging thing. There is, an, I, I mentioned in the video, but it's, um, uh, I mentioned it in the uh, video. It's called, it's a, another extension called the bhatch extension. Uh, it adds more custom definitions. I don't actually use that extension, but it has a really helpful definition in it. And if you watch the screencast, you'll see I go and grab it. And what it allows you to say is when you're running it in Selenium, because it's right, Selenium, well, the nice thing about Selenium is it runs super fast. So you're like, huh, da, 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 you know, and it closes when it fails too. So you can't actually see it. So two things about that, uh, I'm actually going to change gears here. One is it is possible also to have screenshots uh, taken of failures. There's ways to hook in and say it failed. So let's take a screenshot of what we saw. The other thing is you make you bring in this custom definition. And what it is is uh, the language, you can make the language whatever you want. But the language I use is I say, I break. So I will see that I have a failure right before I, let's say, I, I, I'm about to, I say, and I click submit. And I get an error that says, like, no submit button found. So I'm like, what's going on? Is, am I looking at an error page? Is the submit button label something else? So right above there, temporarily, I'll put, and I break. And I'll rerun the test. And what it does is it actually opens up, goes there, does everything. And as soon as it gets to the and I break, it pauses, it freezes. And what it's doing, if you look at the terminal, is it just says, like, press enter to continue. So it'll sit up there and just basically sit there. And you can like right click and inspect element and see whatever you want to do. And as soon as you're satisfied, you can just go back to the terminal and hit enter, and it keeps going. So that's not something that's built into uh, BHAT by default. Um, but like I said, look up the BHATCH extension or watch our screencast. It's about four, it's a function that's about four lines long, and it gives you that capability. Probably should, it probably should be in core, because I basically can't live without it. Any other questions? Ah, uh, uh, yes, have we, are we going to create that? All right, perfect. So we're, we're going to, uh, we is a generous word on my part, uh, create a BHAT group on Drupal.org. Um, so that's not created right now, but it will be created either today or tomorrow. So find on there, we can kind of continue the conversation and, and, and basically hopefully all work together to get more and more definitions and strategies behind this. Yep. IRC? Uh, actually, I don't know if there's an IRC for this. You'd have to look, you'd have to look it up. Um, I, am, I, don't, and I don't know mostly because I get distracted easily on IRC. Awesome. If you, have, if you have more questions, uh, oh, here's one more. Yeah. Yes, I have one question. Uh, where I work at, we have uh, one lady who does all the testing on the front end. So whenever marketing tells us to build something, marketing doesn't actually test it. The people who deal with the people who deal with our website test it. Um, one of the problems that we found is she's a great tester, but a lot of times she can't communicate to us developers, or we don't understand her as well as we should. In this in our scenario, would this be helpful where she actually creates the BHAT uh, win and all that stuff, and then that creates the class and we can go in and modify it as needed? How, how technical is she? And, and what's she doing to test now? Is she testing manually or is she doing like a Selenium test? She's, we thought about throwing Selenium on Firefox for her, but um, I don't think she, she's able to right now. Okay. Yeah, so um, in that case, the, the Basically, one of the beautiful things about using BHAT is when you have developers that are comfortable with PHP, it's going to be a huge tool because you can do whatever you want to. Now, for people that are less technical, um, you basically have a few options. One of the big advantages over this over Selenium is that Selenium requires XPath. It makes your test very fickle. When you write these scenarios, you rely on labels. And so as long as your label doesn't change, no matter if you move things around, then uh, it's going to be less fickle. So um, basically, to answer your question, she may be able to write these tests. I would try that. Um, but it may, it may end up being too technical for her still, even to kind of get this pattern down there. Um, that's something that Melissa is basically looking at as far as like the holistic process of what that would look like. Now, in theory, if the developers are um, also 
writing tests uh, for their application, then you guys are going to be building up a big suite of built-in definitions. And at some point, you could actually have her write those built-in step definitions because uh, she would have a big enough menu that she could actually run those. Now, the only problem with all this still, and this is something that I think that we will fix um, shortly, like over the next six to 12 months, is that there's no way for a non-technical person right now to run their tests. So all of this stuff is great, human readable stuff, but it would still be, I wrote this beautiful human readable thing. It's using all step definitions that are available, but I still need to go give it to a developer so that developer can run it from the command line. Okay? That's something that actually like Melissa with some other people is working on because um, then it's actually quite powerful because uh, then it's just human readable sentences if there were a web interface to actually start using these and click and see if they failed and if they failed at what step did they fail and kind of bring that up to the higher level. Um, then it starts to become a more interesting uh, tool for the less technical people. I think that's very important. Yep. We actually have had some success uh, kind of on that front um, with actually even a client, a client project manager who wrote out what was more or less a set of instructions. Yeah, that, that's pretty, yeah, it's and, not exactly the right format, we, but close enough. Right, and then you, okay, well, this is what they meant to do, and this is the scenario that they want to test, and then you just take and you tweak it so that it fits into the regular expressions. Mm -hmm. um, you get, it, they get it close enough so that you can see what are they trying to test. Your level of effort for building those tests is really nominal once they've done most of the work. To, de to define what they're actually trying to test. So I think that's, yeah, and I think that's, that's it right there. And, and Melissa was actually talking about this. We were in a meeting before this. It was like, you, you don't necessarily expect your project managers or salesmen to write these perfectly, but you can get them to write them in, because the, they're user stories, right? If you're going to talk about the user interaction, you're going to get that. And then you're just saying that the effort to get those into the actual correct syntax, actual correct structured language is nominal. And you're still kind of forced to get into that, um, uh, even though we're the ones writing the Gherkin language, we're forced to get into that structure of thinking about the business value and writing out the requirements from a user perspective. It'll also give you really good insight into, oh, I didn't think of writing a test for this particular component, but now they want me to write this, you know, this one function, this, this one test, this one line. Oh, okay, that's something that's useful. Let's write that. Nice. Oh yeah. So, so you're saying, yeah, and they'll um, they'll kind of uh, in that case, they're almost saying something that is translating to a step that you don't actually have defined because exactly. you didn't really thought about that, but now you can, uh, yeah, now you can define it. Awesome. Cool. All right. If you have any other questions, uh, come find uh, any me or any of the people I mentioned. But thank you guys very, very much. Enjoy the rest of the conference. I'll see you later.